We'll travel to the other side. We'll go to Decatur, Illinois, the most haunted town in America, and visit an English stately home where the ghost of a beautiful lady still searches for her murdered lover. In Pennsylvania, we'll go to a theater with its very own phantom and tell the story of the mysterious airship disaster solved from beyond the grave. We'll see disturbing paintings created by artists long after their deaths and travel to a haunted inn with its own permanent guest. We'll see the strange, the bizarre, the ghostly in Most Haunted Journeys. Cemetery, Decatur, Illinois. Ghost hunters claim this is the most haunted cemetery in the most haunted town in the United States. Once the sun sets on this peaceful vista, turbulence begins. These neat and well-tended Civil War graves cover up a ghastly secret. During the war between the states, trainloads of Confederate soldiers passed through Decatur on their way to a POW camp in Chicago. But in 1863, a train full of southern prisoners made an unscheduled stop near Greenwood Cemetery. Many of the soldiers were suffering from yellow fever. The dead and dying crowded in with the living. Corpses were unloaded and buried haphazardly on this hillside. But in their haste to rid themselves of the diseased enemy, some of the grave diggers may have been too thorough. Not only were the dead unceremoniously dumped here, it seems some not yet dead were buried too. Years later, a flood caused the hillside to collapse, spewing decayed bodies onto the grassy knolls. Many say the ghosts of soldiers are often seen wandering in this area, and their anguished cries can be heard. Others report that here, on these steps, a weeping woman is often spotted. Not an unusual sight in a cemetery, except this particular mourner appears around twilight, and then as night falls, she fades into the darkness. Some say they've seen strange lights dancing around the graves. Here are some photos taken by a Decatur ghost hunter, showing what he claims to be spectral orbs among the tombstones. And then, there's the more concrete evidence of the dear departed. One fine upstanding citizen was not going to let death stand in his way. Mr. Carter had himself placed upright in this six-foot-tall monument. This boarded-up tomb contains Mr. Wessels, whose eternal slumber was rudely disturbed by a couple of kids who decided to get their kicks by removing the coffin from this mausoleum. The would-be grave robbers, however, ended up being much more disturbed than their intended victim. They had never heard of glass-top coffins and were horrified to be confronted with this, the not very pretty sight of a decomposing corpse staring up at them. Visitors leaving the cemetery in Decatur don't leave the ghosts behind. A stroll past the Powers Mansion evokes some strange powers indeed. A spooky house in which few people will stay more than one night, especially men. It is believed that a woman was murdered by her fiancé in one of the bedrooms. This scorned spirit apparently likes to shake things up, especially the bed of a sleeping male. And this is the Millican house, where flu-ridden patients were locked in a basement, emitting screams so terrible, some say they can still be heard today. So what is it about Decatur that keeps the long-dead residents returning to their old haunts? The area was once a sacred Indian burial ground, but it is said when white settlers arrived, the unsettled spirits began to make their presence known. Even a trip to the theater in this spirited town is a ghostly experience. The Lincoln and Avon theaters are the last two survivors of the grand palaces of Decatur's past. The Lincoln Theater was built from the ashes of the Decatur Hotel, which was destroyed in a fatal fire. Though the rubble was removed for construction of the theater, apparently something remained behind. The Lincoln is one of the spookiest theaters in the world. Everyone from Houdini to Bob Hope played vaudeville here, while Red, a star-struck stagehand with dreams of stardom, worked in the wings. One night, Red fell from this treacherous staircase. His arm caught in a rail and was ripped from his body as he fell to the ground, dead. Many have felt his presence. They say they feel cold hands on their bodies or hear footsteps. But one-armed Red is not alone in this palace of the possessed. A woman can often be seen up here in the balcony, walking down to her regular seat where she waits for a show that will never begin. 
And then there's the story of Alan, who psychics say is doomed to spend eternity in this empty theater because he has nowhere else to go. Visitors report dark shadows passing in front of these lights, yet more signs of the ghostly activity here. A Decatur newspaper reporter spent one Halloween night on a ghost hunt. He sat below the stage and became annoyed with the people walking back and forth above him. I kept thinking, I wish they'd knock that off. I wish it'd settle down up there because it's just going to distract those of us who are sitting down here. We're not going to know what we're hearing and, and what those sounds are. And then the sound stopped. Probably an hour later in the evening, we were in the balcony, and there wasn't anybody within any, anybody in my group within 30 feet of me. And again, I heard those same sounds coming from the stage. Uh, people walking. It didn't make any sense to me. And one of the things I said to the members of my group was, I was getting a little annoyed at the people walking on stage because I found it really distracting. And at that point, the other five or six people in the group who were still there looked at me and said, what are you talking about? We didn't hear any noises. I said, I can't believe you didn't hear any noises. There were, it was like people were stomping on the stage, walking back and forth. They all swore they didn't hear anything. Now, I'm not saying it was a ghost, but I know I heard something, and I just don't know what it was. While ghosts seem to be entertaining visitors to the Lincoln Theater, down the road at the Avon, it appears they're just hanging out and enjoying the movies along with the rest of the audience. Gus Kunstan managed the theater for many years and had to be forcibly removed after he sold it. The new owners say they could keep Gus out, but they couldn't break his spirit. I was working in the office upstairs doing measurements and writing things down when I heard a sound out in the hallway. And I turned and looked. There was a man standing in the doorway. And he, he looked as solid as you or I. He was just standing there. I thought it was some homeless person who had uh, broken in the theater and was going to give me some trouble or something. I started to say something to him when he turned and walked down the hallway. The second it took me to get to that hallway, I was going to look at, down the hallway and say, Hey, man, or hey, you. Instead, there was nobody there. And as if to underscore that, there was a flash of lightning that illuminated the entire hallway. And I stood there for a second and I thought, Oh, my God. I just saw a ghost. Well, I got the hell out of this place so fast it was unbelievable. From movie houses to mansion houses, from hillside to graveside, Decatur is positively seething with specters. Even the team producing this segment experienced phantom activity during filming. These photographs were taken by our producer. Strange streaks of white light and a ghostly white building inexplicably appeared in only one photograph. Here, in what ghost hunters call the most haunted town in the USA, the dead coexist peacefully with the living. It seems even for ghosts there is safety in numbers. Pennsylvania seems to boast more than its fair share of ghosts, which is hardly surprising given its extraordinary history. Once called Machunk, which is Native American for Bear Mountain, it was a thriving industrial town during the 19th century. With the decline of coal mining and railroads in the early part of the 20th century, the town's fortunes declined too. So, in hope of drawing tourists and funds for the rapidly dying town, the townsfolk adopted the name of Jim Thorpe, the great Olympic athlete and sporting hero. Here lies Jim Thorpe, whose body was imported and laid to rest in this marble sarcophagus. And while Jim Thorpe's body does seem at peace, there are plenty of restless spirits to be found in town. Here. In the Jim Thorpe Jail, for instance, is the mysterious handprint on the wall, a reminder of a notorious miscarriage of justice which has never been corrected. On June 21st, 1877, four men were hanged here. They'd been found guilty of belonging to a gang known as the Molly Maguires. The murderous Molly Maguires, as some called them. One of them, Alexander Campbell, proclaimed his innocence throughout the trial, but was nevertheless found guilty of murder and sentenced to death. Historian Patrick Campbell is the grand nephew of the condemned man. Before Alec Campbell left um, this particular cell to go to his execution, uh, he, according to legend, turned around and uh, placed his hand on 
this particular spot on the wall and swore his innocence and said that his, this particular handprint would remain on that wall to prove that uh, Carbon County was hanging an innocent man. The handprint is still here. 130 years later, it's one of the most astounding phenomena in the world of the paranormal. Many visitors to the jail claim they've seen Campbell himself sitting in his lonely cell as he waits for the vindication that never seems to come. Further down the street is the inn at Jim Thorpe, and naturally, it's haunted too. The inn was built in 1848 and was a popular place for the elegant visitors who came to Jim Thorpe. However, it seems some of the guests checked in, but never checked out. I was helping guests get candles and flashlights, etc. We had had a power outage, not uncommon on Broadway. I was walking from 203 side. I was swinging my flashlight, just kind of taking my time coming down the hall. Bring up my light. It hits this cloud type thing. I could see a hat. I could see the hair. I could see the dress with the little yellow flowers, a pink sash. No face. The arm part, you could almost like see through any place that there was flesh, you wouldn't see through that, but yet you'd see the dress almost whole. And what happened was it just turned and disappeared right into the doorway. Uh, you want to see somebody take a flight of stairs, you should have seen me fly down those stairs. Most of the activity takes place in room 211, which seems to have an unregistered, permanent, supernatural guest. Well, room 211 seems to be our hot spot room, so to speak. Um, every, all, pretty much anything that's missing or has to do with strange occurrences, 211's the room. 211 gets a lot of people saying stuff about it. Their TV comes on, like they'll be out for dinner, and when they come back into the room, their TV's on, and then they're afraid to go in because they know they're in the haunted room, and they hear that, you know, somebody's in there, and then when they open the door, the TV isn't on. We had a National Guardsman in. He always put his boots facing the door, right right at the door, facing the wall, out. He'd gotten up the next morning, his boots were outside his door. He was quite upset. He thought someone had come in and moved them. We had a gentleman in. He had put his glasses on the night side table. When he'd gotten up the next morning, they were totally gone. When he came back, they still weren't there. He had gone down to dinner. When he came up from dinner, his glasses were in the middle of his back. Legend has it that a woman was meeting her lover in room 211. Some say she had a tragic accident on her way to her assignation. Others, that they were accidentally checked in on different floors and never found each other. Whichever is true, it's alleged the woman is still waiting for her beloved, often returning to the room when a single man checks in. She apparently disrupts his stay by moving his belongings around, desperate to make her presence felt. Couples also have strange experiences in 211. Once, a woman complained that the towels kept falling on the bathroom floor. She'd put them on the towel rail. When she returned, they'd be on the floor again. The towels you might be able to explain away because we had these round rings behind the toilets where we shoved the towels into. They could all fall off, but the bath mat is on the towel bar opposite of the toilet, and even that was in the toilet. Although the entire hotel is non-smoking, guests have complained of smelling cigar and cigarette smoke. Children have been heard running down the hallways when no children have been present. I was always a non-believer until working here, until I actually experienced it. I never before. I always, you know, I was doubtful, let's put it that way. I was a very strong doubting Thomas. No longer. I am now a believer. For ghost hunters, Jim Thorpe could be the perfect destination. Next on Most Haunted Journeys, the real Phantom of the Opera. For a town of Easton, this is Center Square, where on July 8, 1776, when it was originally called Great Square, one of only three public readings of the Declaration of Independence took place. With such a momentous past, it's easy to believe that Easton is a hot spot for hauntings, and visitors doing a little ghost hunting are unlikely to go home disappointed. This is the State Theater's Center for the Arts, which boasts its very own Phantom of the Opera, affectionately known as Fred. 
J. Fred Osterstock was the area manager for the United Artists Theater chain, and he worked out of the State Theater from 1926 until his death in 1957, but it seems he was far too stage-struck to remain in his grave. Fred has been known to wander the boiler room, the stage. He even leaves telltale signs of his cigar smoking. First time I came in contact with uh, Fred, I was manager of the theater, and uh, my office was his office. And uh, at night, uh, every theater has a ghost light that they keep on. I turned the light on, and I saw a gentleman in a gray suit walking off the stage. So I immediately went and turned some more lights on and went onto the stage to see if I could find this person who was there. Uh, I found no one. I checked the entire stage and uh, checked the theater and there wasn't anyone there, so I wrote it off as being a figment of my imagination. Uh, a few days later, I was talking to, uh, I believe it was Charlie Seifert, he was a projectionist at the time, and uh, described the person to him. And he, uh, a few days later, brought in a picture and said, is this the gentleman you saw walking off stage? I said, yeah, who is it? He said, it's Fred Osterstock. That was my first encounter with him. The day I saw Fred was really just an ordinary day. We had had a photo shoot, and I saw a man sitting in the box, and then I thought, wait a minute, there's nobody here. I didn't authorize anybody being here, and I took a step back, and there was nobody in here. So I came in, and I walked down, and I said, hello, hello, excuse me, and I ran up the little steps that lead to that box, and there was nobody there. And I thought, you know, this is ridiculous. And I went into the office, and I said, who let someone in the building? No one's supposed to be in here. And I said, he looks so familiar. And then it was, oh, he looks so familiar because it was Fred. Prior to my becoming a member of the staff, I was toured by a young man through the theater. And as we got to the mezzanine, I thought I smelled smoke. He said, that's the theater ghost. Well, I filed that behind me. I didn't put any credence to it. So we continued our tour, and as we got to the star's dressing room, in the middle of the freshly vacuumed rug was a shiny copper penny. And uh, the young man said to me, well, I guess that is Fred welcoming you aboard. Unfortunately, I lost the penny, which didn't mean anything to me anyway. Within the, those two weeks, I went down into the basement. And in the middle of that concrete floor, to my surprise, was the shiny copper penny. So I was told he was just giving me a, another chance. So I picked it up and there began my journey with Fred and my shiny copper pennies, which he continues to give me to this day. Fred has left Lois more than 70 pennies. He was so dedicated to his beloved theater, a little thing like death couldn't stop him from keeping an eye on the place. We've had experiences with bats, and they, they tend to be on uh, days that we've had a little uh, trouble with some temperament. We had one occasion where the bat came in, um, we don't know how it got in, and flew around the performer, quite literally around the performer above her as she performed her show, to the point that the audience was just carrying on so much that the artist broke character and stopped and said, I'm not that funny, you know, what are you laughing at? Or, you know, reacting to. And she looked up and, and she, she started laughing too and she finally left the stage and, you know, kind of pulled herself together, came back on and completed her, her show. But then we, then we don't find the bats anymore, they just fly right out as though they were, you know, they're here really to be fulfilling some, some sort of mission, which we think they are. Shelley asked us not to show his face. Here he is with Leo, the MGM lion. We don't show Fred. We don't, we don't um, use pictures of Fred because we don't want people to know what Fred looked like because when they come up and tell us that they encountered someone in the hall or they met someone in the basement or they saw somebody in the balcony, we like to hear them describe him. Uh, and that's our little way of knowing whether they really saw Fred. It was at this point that an extraordinary thing happened. Fred decided to pay us a visit while we were filming. If he couldn't be seen, he was determined to make himself heard. I keep hearing noises coming from the far side of the stage, and I asked a few of the guys here, I'm like, who's over there? Who's making those noises? And they're like, we're all over here. There's no one else in here. I hear pingings. I hear stuff rolling, doors closing. Fred must just want to let us know he's here. Well, every time I came into the State Theater, I always went, hi, Uncle Fred, Ray Jr.'s here. 
When Fred's nephew started talking to us, we uh, we had a pipe over here start making some noises. We thought it was a heat pipe, but the heat's turned off and it's still making noises. And uh, I don't know, there's a slight chill over the air once he started talking. That has to be Uncle Fred. I think he knows when I'm here. I hope so, anyhow. Fred is such an important part of the theater scene, he even has an award named after him. The Freddie Awards are given to local high schools in recognition of exceptional accomplishments in the production and performance of the musical theater. For youngsters who feel they may not have a ghost of a chance of making it big on Broadway or in Hollywood, how better to encourage them than by giving them a Freddie, an award named after their very own ghost. Coming up, a real life in You will soon hear of me with my Tucky. Like many towns, people come and go, making it their home for a brief moment in time. Others, however, stay for much longer periods. In fact, they seem to linger long after death is taken. Speedy, for instance, was one Paducan who became a long-term resident. He was an itinerant who died here in 1928. Due to the enthusiastic embalmer and undertaker A.Z. Hammock, he remained firmly above ground until 1994, 66 years after his death, when he was finally buried with all the pomp and ceremony due a dearly loved town mascot, and his grave has become an attraction in Paducah. But perhaps the strangest story is of the ghost of Stella Cohen, who even put in an appearance for us right on cue. C.C. Cohen's is a popular place to visit here in town. It offers the same things as many other taverns. Fine food, good atmosphere, and plenty of spirits. But they're not all in shot glasses. I have been down on 2nd Street late at night, sometimes working on exhibits till 2 o'clock in the morning. And when you leave the museum, uh, which is right across from Cohen's, at 2 o'clock in the morning, you look over here at these upper windows on the building, it's kind of scary sometimes looking over here. I can see where, where a ghost would be right at home. I never really believe in ghosts till I saw one. I believe in spirits first off anyway. I do believe that Stella does still inhabit this place. Stella Cohen lived on this property for most of her life. She was brought here by her father, Abe, who opened a business selling clothes, hats, and shoes. He also ran his own loan office and pawn shop. Stella grew up above the shop on the second floor. She eventually married Ben Piney and moved into a new home with her young husband, where they spent many happy years, until the ghastly day when he was murdered, and Stella, now a grieving widow, moved back into her family home. She worked in the business with her sisters, and together they grew older and more eccentric. The first time I saw the Cohen sisters uh, as a child, uh, they were very eccentric ladies, uh, very old, very um, guarded. They would not speak to anyone they did not know. Uh, they were courteous, but... Uh, And, and lipstick smeared, and, and uh, uh, they just uh, looked very eccentric. When Stella died, her mortal remains were reunited with the rest of her family. But her ghostly presence is very much above ground. The home was sold, and as construction began to turn it into a restaurant, strange things started happening. Then when the demolition and reconstruction was done on the restaurant on all three floors, the... Uh, the workmen then, would they'd lose their tools, their, their tools wouldn't stay plugged into the walls, they, uh, they just had all kinds of little events, no mishaps and nothing malicious, but they, they talked about Stella. The bartender at the time, Steve Servant, a friend of mine, he had finished, uh, everything was cleaned up, general public was all, uh, there was no one here, and uh, he came around and sat down beside me at the bar, and we were talking to each other, and saw a dark figure. She walked across the room between tables, came up uh, a short flight of stairs behind us, and we turned to look to see who it was, and there was no one there. Other employees of C.C. Cohen's have met Stella several times, and just treat her as one of the regulars. The first thing that I had with Stella was I was working a banquet up here one evening, and the windows, the, the sun was coming in through the windows, casting shadows on the opposite wall. And I saw a lady, I saw the shadow of a lady go all the way across the wall. And I said,
assumed it was one of the other servers that was up here with me. So I turned around to look, and I was the only one up here. Sometimes I always feel reminded if I'm by myself coming around up here to say, hello, Stella, or how you doing, you know, and I, maybe just so she won't bother me or anything. Along with the daily specials, new employees learn the legend of Stella. Perhaps so they don't panic when they encounter the flickering lights, the flying dishes, falling trays, and moving chairs. Stella has been seen gliding across the dance floor, peering down from the window, watching the diners from upstairs, or sitting at the end of the bar. As we were filming this story, Stella decided to put in a dramatic appearance. Mary Hammond had a spine-chilling encounter while she was waiting to be interviewed. I sat over to the side and listened to Penny Field tell her story, and she was talking about Stella Cohen, and all of a sudden, my leg, not my thigh, and my forearm, and even up on my cheekbones, you just give me a chill. Just a really strange feeling. I don't think I've quite felt that before. A stunned Mary was apparently touched by Stella, who, it seems, just can't leave her old Kentucky home. Near the Druid Temple of Stonehenge in the heart of the ancient kingdom of Wessex, England, lies 16th century Longleat House. Glastonbury is beyond those hills, the legendary burial ground of King Arthur, and the place where Joseph of Arimathea supposedly brought the Holy Grail. To the west, Warminster, a mecca for would-be UFO spotters from across Europe. This is a land of mists and mysteries. So naturally, in such a legend-shrouded place, a stately home like Longleat has its very own ghost story. A tale of jealousy, madness, betrayal, murder, guilt, and a beautiful, tragic ghost. Thomas, the second Viscount, inherited the house in 1710 at the age of four. He lived the life of idle luxury, riding with the hounds and avoiding all responsibility. Thomas was an unlikable, selfish man. When he married his young bride, Louisa Carteret, he threw his mother out of the house. Reputedly, Louisa was every bit as sweet as Thomas was sour, as vivacious as Thomas was sullen. Everyone adored her, from the most aristocratic guest to the lowliest servant. But the jealous Thomas became suspicious of one particular footman's friendship with Milady. He bribed two servants to ambush him as he came out of the old library. They hurled the unfortunate footman down the stairs. He crashed to the bottom, his neck snapping as he landed. Thomas had him buried in the dead of night and told his wife the footman had been dismissed. Louisa herself died shortly afterwards. Some said of a broken heart. But then the haunting started. The Viscount feared he was being punished for his sins. At night, up in the servants' hallway, he heard his wife, her soft footfalls, and the rustle of fine silk. Her perfume would linger. Up and down she walked, restlessly searching for her lost love. Then one night, he saw her. A shimmering gray shadow. She knew his secret. Thomas fled the house and went into hiding from his wife's vengeful spirit. He never returned. He eventually died a broken man and was buried here at the local cemetery. The story faded into Longleat legend. No one really believed the tale of murder. Although the Grey Lady, as Louisa was now called, was still seen and heard stalking the upper corridors. Three centuries later, workmen dug up some flagstones and found a decomposed corpse in 18th century footman's clothing. The story was true. His remains were put into a hat box and laid to rest here in the cemetery, just a few yards from the grave of Thomas II Viscount. The jealous murderer and his victim, together for eternity. Coming up, England's most haunted village and a doomed airship. Evidence. There's nothing tangible to show genuine contact with the other side. But occasionally, it seems, inexplicable events occur. Like here, in the quiet English village of Woodford, where a young, frightened vicar named John Stiles knew that serious trouble was on its way. It was the 16th century, and St. Mary's Church would have been a far from quiet place. 
After centuries as a Catholic country, England was changing. Henry VIII's spies and soldiers prowled the kingdom, looting churches and killing thousands of Catholic priests. Torn between losing his parish or his head, Stiles decided to escape. But before he left, he crept into the church, knowing he had to take with him the parish's most valuable possession, a solid gold chalice. Narrowly escaping with his life and the chalice, Stiles took refuge in Belgium, only to succumb to a sudden illness and die. On hearing of his death, an old friend of Stiles, Andrew Pollock, the new pastor of St. Mary's, left the vicarage and went to Belgium to recover the chalice. He returned with the valuable relic and something else, the embalmed heart of his friend, John Stiles, which he entombed secretly in St. Mary's Church. Centuries passed, the chalice disappeared, and John Stiles was forgotten. In 1862, the new pastor of St. Mary's began having sleepless nights. A strange mist lingered in the rectory's wood-paneled hallway. Andrew Powlett's spirit had returned, pointing insistently towards one panel in the wall. The vicar loosened this panel. Hidden behind, he discovered the ancient chalice, and in it, a faded map. Following its directions, the apprehensive vicar took a hammer and chisel into the church, to the nave. At the marked spot, the pastor chipped away the old stone of this pillar. Finally, he found the silk-shrouded remains of John Stiles' heart. And here it is, a chilling reminder of a tragic past. In Woodford, it seems, you can find ghostly evidence from beyond the grave if you follow your heart or someone else's. Pluckley, the most haunted village in Britain. The village has stood here for well over a thousand years and has seen more than its share of murder and tragedy along the way. Perhaps it's no wonder then that wherever you turn, there's a ghost story to be told. The manor house, villagers say, is haunted by the Tudor lady who poisoned herself. For the sin of suicide, her restless spirit still wanders, prowling the gardens and the narrow grass alleyways at the back of local cottages. As you'd expect, the local graveyard is haunted too. Here, locals say, on moonlit nights, you can see the Red Lady. A young woman gliding among the headstones, searching endlessly for the grave of her dead child and pulling at her hair in distress. The ghost of a man known only as the Colonel is reputed to drift up these stairs and then vanish at a spot overlooking the tree from which he hanged himself. In the 1700s, a posse of vigilantes hunted down a notorious highwayman here. They found him cowering inside this hollow tree. Six men immediately ran in through with their swords. Many say his blood-drenched ghost still walks these roads. The local brickwork is said to be haunted by the screaming, flailing ghost of a local workman who slipped while working at the top of his kiln chimney and plunged to his death. The schoolhouse also has its tragic ghost story. One day in the late 1920s, the headmaster here sent all the children outside to play. After an hour or so, when no one rang the bell, some of the children wandered back inside. They found their headmaster hanging from a roof beam. Here at Pinnock Bridge, an old gypsy woman would sit in the evenings. Legend has it that sparks from her pipe set her dress on fire. And to this day, people still describe a burning woman running across the road in front of them, desperately beating at the flames as they engulf her. At night, the road out of the village resounds to the thundering hooves of a phantom coach pulled by four jet black horses. Those who have glimpsed the coachman say he is headless, and with a cracking whip, urging his spectral steeds on as if the devil himself were snapping at his heels. And that may well be the case, because anything can happen in the most haunted village in England. It was a dull, gray London evening when psychic Eileen Garrett gathered a group of friends for a seance in this room just off Piccadilly. 
They were trying to reach writer Arthur Conan Doyle. But instead, as the candles fluttered in the dark room, they began receiving messages from an airship pilot. He said he had a story to tell. This is the story. On a cloudy afternoon on October 5th, 1932, a small crowd of people gathered here in Cardigan, England. They were here to see off Her Majesty's airship, the R-101, on its maiden voyage. It was the largest, most advanced airship ever built. A truly awesome sight. Though there were many doubts as to whether the R-101 could even fly, the scheduled journey was to India, almost one-third of the way around the world. The R-101 was to be the pride of the British Air Force, and its triumphant journey to the far reaches of the Empire showed the world what British engineers could achieve. However, as the crews said their goodbyes, many of them suspected the truth, that the R-101 was unlikely to make the journey intact. On the day that the airship was leaving, we had our dinner, and I walked down the, the road, down to the mark, towards the mast, to with my father, but he stopped me halfway down. He said, there's one thing I want you to promise me, that you'll look after your mother and your sister for me, because I might not be coming back off of this trip. And with that, I went back and I never saw him anymore. Fascinated by the details of what she was being told, Eileen Garrett gathered her friends the next evening. They made contact once again with the other side. Soon, the airship captain was back, with more to tell. As it lumbered across the English Channel, the airship was so low that the crew could see the white crests of the waves. The weather report told of winds up to 50 miles per hour, faster and fiercer than any airship had ever encountered. At five minutes past two, the airship dipped slightly. The crew tried desperately to jettison ballasts and regain height. But they didn't know that the front of the ship had been breached and they had been steadily losing gas. The R-101 went down near the French village of Beauvais. It was a night of great tragedy. Hot exhaust from the engines had ignited the highly flammable oxygen and hydrogen mixture the whole airship went up in a fireball that lit up the night sky for miles around. Weeks later, Eileen Garrett traveled to Cardigan, where the victims had been buried in a mass grave. She knew the truth behind the disaster must have been too great to cover up. When she took her notes to the Ministry of Defense, she was quizzed by top engineers. They were baffled that a woman with no technical knowledge had all this information. Soon afterwards, a secret document was released confirming that everything the spirit told Eileen was true. Although certified by the government as airworthy, the R-101 hadn't been ready to fly. Eileen Garrett never heard from the spirit again. His story told the pilot can rest in peace. But for the R-101, it would not be such a peaceful rest. Girders from the wreckage were used in a new airship called the Hindenburg. Coming up, bizarre paintings from beyond the grave. The road, but is it? Here in Père Lachaise Cemetery in Paris, visitors thronged the grave of Alain Kardec, the so-called father of spiritualism. They believe he had the key to the other side. Another famous believer was Sir Arthur Conan Doyle, creator of Sherlock Holmes, who regularly attended seances in London to make contact with his dearly departed son. But famous escapologist Harry Houdini argued that spiritualism was humbug and fraud. So who's right? What if there's evidence of life after death? Visible evidence in the form of fascinating art from beyond the grave. This is Nova Paca, in the middle of the Czech Republic. The town of Nova Paca is home to an extraordinary museum, which many people claim provides proof of an afterlife. For centuries, this area has been a magnet to those who believe in life after death. But when this man, Karol Szczynski, arrived in town, he formalized the spiritualist movement. He published magazines and created a society of spiritualists who live and pursue their beliefs here. These early 20th century photographs show some of the seekers of truth who gathered here. 
The members carried registration books, like this one belonging to a tailor called Yosef Hovar. Everyone observed a strict code of conduct which stipulated no drinking, no smoking, no swearing, and no sex. But the ban on drinking seemed to encourage a glut of spirits of another sort. These rules clearly concentrated the thoughts of the members on higher matters and created an atmosphere which would generate some bizarre communications from the other side. During seances in this room, the most extraordinary and in some cases chilling pictures were drawn. It's believed these pictures show inhabitants of another world, not people who had passed over, but creatures bearing no resemblance to anything a living person would recognize. Images like this monster, or this dragon-like creature. Strange, ethereal pictures. Reportedly, once a trance-like state had been reached, the drawer would begin to create these illustrations, representing creatures from another dimension. The artists, who were ordinary people with no artistic training, would draw these incredibly complicated images in a very short time. The strokes are strong and clearly defined, none of the hesitancy one would expect of a novice. Mediums believed themselves to be possessed by spirits of artists who had passed over and wanted to convey the amazing sights they were experiencing. The drawings were done in front of witnesses who would confirm the time taken to create the images. Some of the drawings illustrate distant worlds, but still of this dimension. Pictures like these of plants from Uranus. And Juno. Jupiter and Mars. Here are underwater creatures from Venus and Mars. But these communications from beyond were not just in the form of paintings. Here are some examples of automatic writing, where the writer's hand and mind is supposedly possessed, and the words are those of another being. Not everything in this museum is via third-party intervention. In fact, the most haunting and terrifying images are these. This is the picture of a goblin, according to the photographer who took it near Novapaka. It is claimed this face was created from ectoplasm, the haunting manifestation of a being from beyond the grave, which appeared at a seance. Visitors entering this museum walk through a door, which reminds them this is a place dedicated to those who have crossed over. And most would be forgiven for believing they had stumbled into a strange, surreal art gallery. But this is a place where two worlds collide. They say that art imitates life. But here in Novapaka, it seems that art is the work of...